Don Cuglione, I have a favor to ask of you. I have too much homework. I'm bored by distance learning. Don Cuglione, I come to ask you a favor today. What do you want, Don Cuglione? I'll do anything. I've known this student for many weeks, and this is the first time you come to see me. I can't remember the last time you invited me to go down. Let's be honest, you were afraid to be in my debt. I understand you found paradise in the park. Come to me asking Don Cuglione. Please give us less homework. Someday, that day may never come. I may ask of you for more homework. And on that day, accept this gesture as a gift. Box. That class is a little too young for us today. That's a little too old, Copy Box. We need to go to a modern 2020 classroom. Let's go. That's better, Copy Box. All right, students, who's ready for day four? I am. Let's do it. All right, Geopolitics, welcome back. Day four. Got to talk country of the day. Neighbors to the north, the Canucks. The Canadians. So Canada is our country of the day. Now Canada, a lot of land, most of it lives close to the United States border because of how cold it is in the northern part of Canada. That's where you would have your native peoples, the Inuit, and the Inuit also live in reservations in Canada as well, and they also have a dark history with the imperialization of the Brits and the French and all Europeans that came over. Uh, so we no longer use the E word in referencing that group. It would be Inuit now. Now, Canada is distinct in the fact of its two colonizers. In the West, part of, you know, we have a province even called British Columbia. So what do you think that influence is going to be? That's going to be an English-speaking predominant part of Canada that has a lot of British residual leftovers from the colonization there. In the East, it's going to be French-Canadian. In your cities like Montreal, sounds very French, right? French established city. So you're going to have French speaking population in the east, and those are going to be two very uh, diverse groups within Canada, kind of like the United States has its uh, geographical regions as well. Uh, California, very much different than Mississippi. New York, very much different than Tennessee. So your east and western Canada parts are going to be uh, unified as a nation, but they are going to be distinctly different in their own cultures. Now, it is an incredibly polite culture, uh, very well educated, uh, very high literacy rate. All of these things tend to go hand in hand, as we learned early in the class. When you have education, it leads to more civil liberties, more civil rights, more education, more democracy, more choice for the people. But it relies on having an educated populace. Now, we're going to get to R in Christ, religion. As of 2019, 55% of Canadians identified as some branch of Christianity. The uh, Catholic and Lutheran versions of that would be the highest up on the list. 29% of Canadians would say they were unaffiliated. That would be agnostic or atheist. So, you have a thin majority of uh, Canada being a Christian majority, a thin margin. All right, intellectualism, I and Cripes. What is the access to education in Canada like? Well, Canada has an incredible education system, and they even get free, mostly free, almost entirely free college if you're a resident in Canada. So in the United States, we get K through 12. In Canada, you get beyond that. And once again, when you pay for education, it's called an investment in human capital. You're the humans investing in you so it benefits society and the economy 
once that investment has paid off. Now, what is the uh, public education system like in Canada? It's a very good one. Very good public education system, accessible by uh, all groups in Canada. Uh, there's not as much poverty in Canada as we have in the United States, but the impoverished in Canada have access to a public education, which is not always the case in a lot of countries. Uh, there's free college for citizens, and they have an excellent university system. Now, P in Christ, political. Now keep in mind, they're a democracy, but they're not a presidential republic like we are. They're a parliamentary republic. Very similar to the British style of having a parliament, a majority uh, party having their prime minister selected from that majority party. So, right now, Canada has a prime minister. And that was picked from the majority party in Canada after their last election. So they are a parliamentary republic. Now, this is one of the most effective uh, democracies in the world, and there is a democracy rating by an international agency, and it's access to voting, uh, how, how pure your democracy is, is there voter suppression, which puts the United States down on the list. North Carolina has been ranked as worse than some uh, African warlord countries as far as fair elections go, and that's in the United States. So Canada has a well-respected democracy globally, and of that democracy ranking, they're 8 out of 167 countries. To put that in perspective, the United States is 25th. A lot of that has to do with some of the voting suppression efforts that happen in the United States. So they have an excellent democracy, excellent education system, excellent health care system. Okay, so what's the economic structure of Canada? What kind of economic system do they have? And what do their economics look like? What are their opportunities? How much GDP do they produce? Well, the economic system in Canada is a mixed market capitalistic system just like the United States. It's the 10th largest economy in the world by itself. Obviously, the United States is number one. Uh, and it is approximately the same population as I record this video of California. Roughly 40 million Canadians, there's roughly 40 million Californians. Now, California, interestingly enough, by itself, keep in mind, we're a part of the United States, so we contribute to those numbers. But the United States takes a lot of its GDP from California because if you split California off and it was its own country, California is the fifth largest economy in the world by itself. Some of that has to do with geography. We are a, a coastal city, so we have two very major ports in San Pedro and in San Francisco, which a lot of that commerce goes to the rest of the states. We also have a giant state with a large amount of population, and we have the tech capital of the world in Palo Alto. So the United States really gets a lot of its GDP boost from California, Texas, New York primarily. Okay, so Canada completes a very important trade agreement, and you will definitely need to know the trade agreements across the world for this class, and it makes it part of the economic requirement of this class. We are part of the USMCA, and that stands for United States, Mexico, Canada Agreement. And it is essentially NAFTA with some renegotiated auto part uh, 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 terms of trade between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And what a trade agreement does is it eliminates trade barriers between those countries, and it comes up with fair terms of trade. A Unit 2 concept for this class is going to be comparative and absolute advantage in designing fair terms of trade. Because I will show to you mathematically that international trade benefits everybody if the terms of trade are fair. Pretty uh, interesting concept that everybody can benefit from economic growth and good trade agreements. Now socially, uh, the Canadians tend to be very peaceful, very friendly individuals. It's not uncommon in many suburbs in Canada to leave your door unlocked overnight. That would probably be a uh, foreign concept to a lot of Americans. Now, uh, hockey is a national sport in Canada. It certainly is revered in Canada. A lot of that has to do with geography. And where in Southern California, we might be able to go outside and see a beautiful baseball field and play on it 350 days out of the year. In Canada, all the lakes are frozen over most of the year. Ice skating makes sense. So there's a big uh, emphasis on hockey in Canada. And many Canadian actors and comedians influence American culture. There are many, many, many American, uh, I mean Canadian comedians who have been coming to the United States since the 1970s. Uh, there have been many Canadian actors who have come over to the United States in many different genres. 
So there is a big Canadian influence on American culture as well. And then, of course, the most Canadian thing there is, the Canadians have a huge maple syrup industry where they quite literally keep a uh, quantity control on to keep the price where it's at. So what that has done is it's created a government agency to watch over the maple syrup industry and make sure nobody's violating the amount that can be produced and sold per month, per quarter, per year. And because whenever you have something like that, it's always going to create a black market. So there's quite literally a black market for Canadian maple syrup in Canada.